Hello, welcome everyone. I am very delighted today to introduce to you someone whose work I greatly admire. Um, she is a very warm and genuine person um, and one who speaks from the heart with great authenticity, uh, depth, and candidness. Uh, Ruth Ross, the author of Coming Alive, The Journey to Reengage Your Life and Career. Uh, my name is Nicole Print, and I am a member of Google's People Operations team. Um, I myself am deeply fascinated by the topic of engagement. And when Ruth's book um, was brought to the attention of our Google Talks group, uh, I was thrilled to have the opportunity to invite Ruth to speak here and was even more thrilled when she accepted. Um, so Ruth has a history of 30 years in, as an executive human resources, as a human resources executive um, at some of the world, uh, several <laughs> world-renowned brands such as Wells Fargo, American Express, and Charles Schwab. And throughout today, she will tell us a bit about her own experience with disengagement um, throughout her talking <laughs> through her book. Um, so if you could please join me in welcoming Ruth Ross. Great, thank you. Thank you. Having admitted to being disengaged at one point yourself, can you give us a little bit of your backstory in terms of your experience and why you decided to write this book? Sure. First of all, thank you so much um, for coming. I know there are many choices you have to do with your time, especially at lunch, and so I'm, I'm very honored that you're here. And so let me just start off by giving you a little bit of a quick background. As Nicole said, I was a human resources executive for 30 years, so that means I started when I was a teenager, and we're all just going to believe that premise, right, and go from there. And so I worked the first half of my career in New York City for some incredible companies and spent time down on Wall Street. And in 1996, was recruited by Charles Schwab to come to San Francisco. Best decision I ever made. Uh, first of all, come on, let's be real, living in the Bay Area, but worked for a phenomenal company at a time when they were growing substantially, and then spent the last 10 years of my career as an executive VP of HR for Wells Fargo Bank during some of the most turbulent times that one could ever imagine in the workplace, right? 2008, the world's coming to an end from a financial perspective. And I was actually working for the CFO of the company at the time. And not long after, Wells Fargo did a major acquisition, doubled in size overnight. And you can just imagine the kind of craziness and, and the amount of work that ensued. And somewhere along the way, I want to say kind of late 2010, I had what I refer to as my face in the mirror moment. So like we all do, we get up in the morning and take a shower, get dressed. And I was looking in the mirror, kind of combing my hair, putting on my makeup. Thankfully, my husband was already out of the house. And I literally stopped, looked in the mirror, and I just screamed out loud, and I'll make it clean, because we're on video, <laughs> but when are you ever going to admit that you are completely dead inside? Just screamed it. Kind of stood there and said, my passion for what I did was gone. I had always prided myself that I was very passionate. I believed in what I did, but I was dead inside. And there are just so many reasons, and we'll talk more about that as we get into this. But that was my epiphany, my face in the mirror moment. And I knew in that split second that I screamed that I had to do something about it to change my life. Fast forward, kind of created a plan. Circumstances arose such that I was able about nine months later to be able to walk away and start my new life. And my new life was all about doing what I was passionate about and what gave me joy. And part of that was helping others. And I won't make anyone raise their hands because I would never embarrass people this way. But if you just think to yourself, my guess is every one of us has either been through this personally, know someone close to us, a friend, a colleague, a relative, who's gone through some bout with disengagement, or maybe you manage someone who's disengaged. Because I bet every one of us has. It's that pervasive out there. 70% of the US workforce has identified themselves as disengaged. 
That means only 30% are truly engaged at what they do, and my guess is they're all sitting right here in Google <laughs> and not anywhere else. And in the world, only 13% of people are engaged. So it's a pretty big issue. And I started talking to people about what I went through, and everybody had a story. And the next thing you know, I did something really crazy. I decided to write a book, and I'm sitting here today. Why did you decide to call the book Coming Alive, The Journey to Reengage Your Life and Career? So the reason I decided to call the book what I did is that a couple of things happened for me along the way. The first is that when we leave, when we go to school and we decide upon our career, we embark on our first job, nobody hands you a roadmap or a, G are there still roadmaps out there? <laughs> or a GPS device, right? Nobody hands that to you. It's go forth, go work. And you don't think about a career that you're passionate about. It's about a job. And really what it is, it's a journey. And over the course of your working life, you may start out at one place, but you're going to go through a lot of detours along the way. And that's what engagement's really about. It's that journey to start an engagement, to get to where you want to be. You may detour into disengagement and hopefully end up back at re-engagement. The second reason I called it uh, what I did is because I started to realize that this isn't just about a work issue. You can't compartmentalize your life. What happens at work affects you at home, and what happens at home impacts you at work. You know, if you're dealing with some issues at home, whether it's maybe with children or financial issues or relationship issues, and you're stressed out about that, trust me, when you get dressed in the morning, that stress gets dressed with you and comes into work. If you're dealing with an issue in the workplace, let's say you are being bullied at work. I've been through that. I don't just leave that at the door when I leave the office at night. Those feelings come home with you. And so that's why I decided to really look at this as about being reengaged and coming alive in both your work and your life. Throughout your book, you, and as you mentioned, you highlight the disengagement affects everyone from college students to executives. And your book is written in a very practical and personal manner rather than as an academic study. Um, what, was this your intent to write the book that way? And if so, why did, why did you choose to write in that style? Absolutely my intent. It was not accidental. You know, engagement is a topic that, believe me, there are thousands of books out there on this topic. Everyone is talking about it. And there's some incredible works that are out there. And there's a lot of people who have written from a very academic and theoretical perspective. That's great, and I admire many of them. That's not me. I'm really of the plain talking, from the heart, keep it simple, and tell stories. Because this really is personal, and I wanted something that is really easy to read, that you can pick up at any time and get through it in one sitting. It's only 126 pages. And I think the best compliment that I've heard from people who have read the book is when I hear people say things to me like, it was the first time since college that I took out a highlighter and I dog-eared some pages. And I just keep going back to it. I can't have a better compliment than that. So truly, that's exactly what I wanted. Um, now, in your book, you say that engagement can occur and it, at an exquisite level between your heart and soul and career. What's the connection for you between your work on re-engagement and your heart? There is such a connection. You know, we all think about the heart and how, you know, I'm looking around this room and a lot of you are trying to eat really healthy today. Not all of you, but a lot of you, right? And it's all about exercising. We were talking earlier about running and there's so much that people do to really work on being heart healthy. When truth be told, you also have to work on it from a work perspective. When you love what you do and you're passionate about what you do, 
it impacts your heart in a really great way. And you know, one of the things I think about, you know, when we hear the word engagement, and if you're not someone like Nicole and I who live about this stuff, right, <laughs> and we study it, but to most people, engagement is when you commit yourself in a deeply committed partnership with the person you love. It's when one person usually gets down on one knee and <laughs> asks someone to marry them or, or, or be in a partnership. But truth be told, you can also really commit in a deep way to the mission and vision and values of a company as well. And when I think about this, and I think about some examples, you know, when people just say, I do a job as versus a career, Think about the doctor who doesn't just say they practice medicine, but rather they tell you they save lives. Or a personal injury attorney who doesn't just practice law, but they actually stand up for others who can't. Or maybe it's the owner of a mom and pop pharmacy who stays an hour after closing because he heard that a little boy in the neighborhood was sick and needed medicine. Or it's the chef who owns an Italian restaurant and gets up at the crack of dawn to make pasta from scratch because that's how his grandmother did it in the old country. That's not about just going to a job. That's being passionate about the work that you do. And I'll share a, a quick little story with you that really brings it home for me around the question that Nicole just asked me. So my mother-in-law, is 89 years old, and she's had Alzheimer's for a number of years now, and she's doing fantastic. She's really, really doing great. And my husband is very diligent about calling her on a frequent basis. And when you have a conversation with someone who has Alzheimer's, someday it can be a great conversation, and some days you struggle, right? It's, it's difficult. Well, on this particular day, she was doing fantastic. And she was asking about me. And my husband, whose name is Sandy, said to her, Mom, do you remember I told you Ruth was writing a book? Well, I'm really excited to tell you she's now finished it, and it's with the publisher. And so she asked my husband, what's it about? And he said, with some trepidation, he said, it's about employee engagement. And the reason he hesitated was his mother has not been in the workplace Right? in probably over 50, 55 years. Right? How is she going to understand what employee engagement is? So he takes a deep breath, and he gets ready to kind of tell her what employee engagement is all about. And she stops him mid-sentence and said, oh, honey, I know what that's about. That's when you have employees who are hands-on and have their hearts open. Can't say it better than that. Very cool. So at Google, we strive to create a magical culture um, and magical experiences for our employees. What are the must-haves a company needs in order to achieve high engagement? You know, it's a great question because when I did ask around a little bit, you know, about Google, what's the one word you'd use to describe culture? And I did hear quite a bit about magic. And for me, there is a magic when you hit high engagement. And there are really five must-haves that employees want from their employers. And the first is meaning. People want to work for a company that has meaning. You can't get much better than this company. The things that you do and create here change people's lives. That's meaning. You know, another company I love to highlight is Tom's Shoes down in Southern California. For every pair of shoes you buy, Tom donates a pair of shoes. For every bag of coffee you buy, they donate water to people in need. That is incredible meaning. The next must-have is alignment. And alignment is all about every day when you come into work, you want to know <coughs> excuse me, exactly where the company is going. What's the mission? What's the purpose? What are you doing? Why are you here? It's about being transparent. So alignment is really important no matter where you work. 
The third one must have is growth. So back when I was working in the workplace, we actually had things like career ladders. You know, you start at one level and then you move to the next level and the next title. Thankfully, that is long gone. And now it's all about growth, it's about learning new things, working on different projects. You know, there are so many um, programs here at Google where you can transition from one project to another or kind of bungee in and do something and then go back to what you were doing. That's all about creating an artist palette of skills as versus how am I getting to the next level and the next level. The fourth must have is input. Every one of you in this room today and all of your colleagues are here at Google because you know that people want to hear what you have to say. And they ask you for your opinion, I hope, and you give input to what's going on. There's nothing worse than working in an environment where that feels stifled and you don't feel like you have a voice. And the final, and by now hopefully you figured out I'm probably going to spell magic. <laughs> so the fifth is uh, C is context. And context is all about the simple question of why. You know, when you ask a kid to do something, the first thing they say to you is why. That doesn't change when you get into the workplace. People want to understand the why behind the what. And if you do nothing else to create magic, it's about that context. Don't just make decisions and tell people, but really explain what's behind the decision. Because I promise you, if leaders do that, people will follow them, and that will create magic. Throughout the book, a lot of your stories are representative of people in very different stages throughout their careers. How would you address the, the misconception that disengagement only occurs after someone's been in a role for a really long time and have been somewhat jaded? Yeah. There's definitely a misconception about that. You know, people think the longer you've been in the job, the more that this happens. You know, truth be told, disengagement doesn't discriminate. It doesn't matter if you are first year out, if you're 30 years into a career. It doesn't matter if you're a secretary or you're a CEO. It doesn't matter what part of the country or the world you live in. It can happen to anyone at, at any time. I'm even seeing this on college campuses where people are saying to me, wow, I need to take a step back because I'm in a major that maybe this isn't really what I want to do, right? So this happens to people at all levels. And I'll, I'll tell you a, a quick funny story to illustrate this. About a year, year and a half ago, I had a client I work with out in Salt Lake City. And so I travel from the Bay Area to Salt Lake a lot. And when you fly out, it's these little kind of two and two across planes, so kind of those intimate sardine cans. And I'm sitting on the aisle, and I met my neighbor who was in the window seat when he went to put his oat bag in the overhead compartment and his computer fell and hit me in the head. Not a way I'd recommend of meeting your seatmate. And of course he was very apologetic and we started to chat when he sat down and we were talking about what he does and he creates videos in the advertising space and he asked me what I did and I explained that I was writing a book about re-engaging in life and and disengagement and he turned to me and he said here's my contact info I'm going through that now you should interview me for the book so I said great took his card and he went back to do his work and I went to read my you know probably some embarrassing magazine like us or people and about two minutes later I get a tap on my right shoulder from the woman across the aisle and by the way this guy was probably in his 30s I would say I get a tap from this woman, and she whispers to me, I didn't mean to listen in, but I'd love to talk to you as well. I've gone through that, and as a matter of fact, I'm now relocating to the Bay Area to take a new job with my company to hopefully get re-engaged. And I said, who do you work for? She goes, and she points to her lapel where there's a little pin and it was the pin from the airline that we were flying on. I said, okay. So I take her information 
And about 20 minutes later, we land. And I'd say that she was probably in her 40s, early 40s. And on these small planes, you have to um, gate check your bag. So I'm waiting at the jetway to get my bag to go to my meeting. And a woman comes up, stands next to me, and probably a woman in her early 60s. And she turns to me and says, I was eavesdropping. I was sitting in the aisle behind you. And I'd love to talk to you as well. Turned out she lived a block away from me in San Francisco. There you have it, three generations. How and when does disengagement happen? And what are some of the underlying causes that lead to disengagement? So disengagement can happen in a moment where you least expect it. And you can slide in and out of this. And the best analogy I can give is that many of us, when we were children, had a seesaw in a playground or in our backyard that we played on. And if you think about a seesaw, the intent is to be level, right, and remain level. But any little motion can cause one person to soar high and another one to kind of crash your butt right on the floor, right? And a seesaw is in constant motion. And that's what happens kind of with engagement and disengagement, right? You kind of float from one thing to another. It's not usually one particular event, but I call it a series of paper cuts. My boss yelled at me in front of some colleagues today. Paper cut. My project got rejected by someone. Paper cut. They just announced the third reorganization in a year, and this one's dumber than the previous two. Paper cut, right? So each one in itself, you kind of just deal with, right? Just like a paper cut, oh, it's annoying, and you complain, and then you go about your business. But when one starts to happen on top of another, on top of another, it starts to cut deeper, and you start to bleed. And that's kind of what happens. And so I mentioned earlier that there are lots of people who have written books around engagement. And the one thing we have in common is that many of us agree on some of the underlying causes that tend to bring this feeling about. The first is the job's not what was promised. right? How many of us have been sold something really great about a job, and then we get there, and we get involved in it, and we're sort of like, what? and you begin to kind of feel like the square peg in the round hole, that's one way. Another is this feeling of being stuck. Maybe you've been in the job for a long time. You're kind of not moving to the next level or learning the new skill, or maybe your compensation's been frozen because you're at the max of that level. That's feeling stuck. A third way is lack of appreciation or recognition. Right? How simple is it just to say thank you for a job well done? And I know you've got lots of initiatives here to appreciate and recognize people. But sometimes just a simple thank you from a manager can go a long way. The fourth underlying cause is a bad manager. And these are usually people who have every great intention in the world but they don't know how to manage. And think about a company like this where you have a lot of amazing people that are individual contributors, and you might be the best technology person in the world or the best marketing person or whatever, but somebody taps you on the shoulder and goes, hey, Nicole, congratulations, you're now a manager. First thing I say is, now what? That doesn't mean that you get up all of a sudden the next day and go, oh, I know how to manage. I know how to coach and write performance reviews and do all of that kind of stuff. And so that's the bad manager, well-intentioned, but needs some help. And the fifth is one that's most troubling because it's epidemic right now, and that's bullying or toxic work environment. I, and again, I won't embarrass anyone by saying, have you ever worked for a bully? But trust me, many of us have. Those bullies are everywhere in the corporate environment. And that kind of toxicity is one of the leading causes of disengagement. Through these causes, are there symptoms that someone would show when they're disengaged? And how can we be better at recognizing and, and diagnosing those symptoms? So I think what happens with symptoms is that first you want to think about what does a great, engaged, magical culture look like, right? And we can look around Google and see a lot of that. 
but not every company is as lucky. But the holy grail is companies where you see people who are really creative and innovative and willing to take risks, and they're energetic about what they do, and they're committed, um, and it just, you feel that vibrancy. What happens with disengagement is it shows up in two ways. It shows up individually, and it shows up organizationally. So let's talk individually first. From an individual perspective, what you start to see in people, maybe you start to notice some mood swings that maybe you hadn't seen before. All of a sudden, people start coming in a little later, maybe leaving a little earlier, maybe they're absent a little bit more. In meetings, they isolate themselves. You know, there's kind of like they sit back with the arms folded, don't contribute like they used to, maybe slipping on deadlines. They give poor customer service. And you can see this kind of lethargy, right? The energy just really kind of slows down. And then organizationally, organizations that have low engagement overall tend not to be creative and innovative. There are they're not comfortable with change. They don't have great customer service and relationships. And depending on the industry, they might have increased safety issues because people aren't really paying attention. So it can manifest itself in different ways. In the book, you refer to kind of the treatment to this as your alive treatment plan. What is the, your secret to effective re-engagement? Uh, so thank you for asking that. So, uh, on the screen when we had it up where you saw Alive in the title of the book, I did that for a reason. You know, as I've talked about some of this stuff, right, there's underlying causes and there's symptoms and you can diagnose it and, you know, it sounds kind of medical, right? People in poor health. And so I really wanted to come up with something to get people back to good health. And I call that Alive. And here's really the key to this. It's just a conversation like we're having today. It's about connecting. I think people have lost the art of how to connect with each other. Right? I had a boss that never had one-on-one -on -one meetings. And everything was done through email. There was no connecting. And so it really has its roots in what I call a stay conversation. It's holistic medicine. right? You can do it at any time. It's not about performance. So what I advocate is a five-step where I say a manager and employee should have a conversation about twice a year where this is not about performance. Go out and have a cup of coffee or come to the one of, what, 23 cafeterias <laughs> here, right? Just sit down, get out of the office, just have a conversation and connect. And so the A in Alive is about ask. And the ask is just having a conversation about how are things going? You know, what's really working for you? What's not? What obstacles are in your way? What stops you from being excited about getting up in the morning and coming into work? Or conversely, what makes you want to jump out of bed and come to work? And the next step is listen. And the listen is about listen to what people say, but also what they don't say. The body language is equally as important. So if I'm having a conversation with Nicole, who's my manager, and She's asking me something, and I'm kind of sitting there, and I'm not really looking at you in the eye, and I'm looking down at the ground. She might want to think, there's something going on here. There's something that's a pain point. But conversely, if I'm talking about something like a new initiative, and I'm excited, and my eyes light up like bulbs on a Christmas tree, you want to note that as well, because that might be something to work on. The next step is I for identify. And that's really when it's about the manager saying, I'm going to think about this the next 24 hours. What did I hear from Ruth? What did I see? And now I want to come up with one to two, maybe three reaction steps. I want to react to what I heard and saw to come up with some ideas to re-engage that person. And then the V is validation, where the manager and the person get back together within the same week for a short meeting just to say, hey, great meeting with you. Heard what you had to say. Great conversation. I have some ideas I want to run by you. You looked really excited when you talked about bringing in this author to come speak at Google. I'd love you to take charge of that and invite them in. Or I'd love you to work on this project. 
or our, I could tell that how many steps it takes in the sales process to close a sale is painful. I think we can work on ways to skinny that down, right? That's validating the conversation. And E is simply executing on the plan. It's that simple, and it really works, and it doesn't cost you anything. And especially here, because the coffee's free, right? <laughs> so there's no cost. Why not do it? I guess if you identify that you are disengaged and you decide to stay, what, what is the, your call to action for people with regard to this book? And what can they do if they are in this spot or see someone else? You know, I think what's really important to understand is this is not rocket science. I will leave the rocket science to you guys. <laughs> this is not at all. This is so incredibly simplistic that sometimes even I shake my head and say, is it really this simple? And the answer is yes. And so there's a couple of things. And you know, I talked in the question before about a manager having a conversation. You know, if your manager is not offering to have that conversation, ask for it. Invite them, right? Yeah. And the whole point of this is you have a choice. Anyone has a choice. If you have friends who are going through this that maybe work for a company that's not as magical as Google, tell them to find their voice. Because really, there's only kind of three things that happen, right? When I had my moment, if they have their face in the mirror moment, and they reflect and they say, I'm disengaged, they can choose to just say, I own it. That's what's happening. And I need to be here, and I'm going to be here until something changes, right? Until maybe I get to a place where I can do something different. But I own that choice. Or you can choose to go to your manager and say, you know, I'd love to tweak some things. I mean, think about the things you guys have here right, where you can go do some other work. You can do explorations. You can do bungee. You can you know, spend 20%, up to 20%, I think it is, right, of your mm -hmm. time working on other projects. That's the single best cure for disengagement around. I wish other companies would learn from what you guys do, because that's incredibly powerful. What that's saying is we don't want to lose the employees who are here. We value them. You are the competitive advantage. Why wouldn't you have that kind of conversation right? Mm -hmm. and be free to have that? Or frankly, the third choice is you can just choose to say, you know what? I'm going to go do something else. I'm going to walk away. And it may not happen overnight. And it's about creating lifelines and creating a plan and think about what you do. And one of the things I tell people, particularly people that are earlier on in their career, and I would say it to every one of you, everyone tells you to save for retirement. And you absolutely 1,000% need to be saving for retirement. But you also need to save for a walk away fund, right? So that you have the ability to not feel stuck if that's how you feel, but that you have the ability to do something else and to be able to say, you know what? Not right for me now. I'm going to walk away. And the thing that I tell people is you always want to walk towards something instead of running away from something that's maybe not as good. Because the power is all within you to kind of find your voice. And to bring this all back kind of full circle, that's what happened to me. You know, I had those feelings that it wasn't right. And truthfully, I felt invisible, even in a very visible role. And I had to kind of create a lifeline so that I could take control and say, I'm never going to let that happen to me again. I need to go do something I'm passionate about. And that's when the best work comes in, no matter whether it's here or another company, or in my case, in my own home office. So at that, um, just sort of looking at the time, why don't we kind of stop there and see if there are questions? Yes, yes, definitely like to open it up to any questions. 
The question is about with, the, with technology being what it is and everybody just totally connected and wired, is that really having an impact? And I would say absolutely. You know, and it's always going to be what it is, but it, it takes us away from connecting and having conversations. And truth be told, when I talked about Alive, if you have that conversation even once, maybe twice a year with the person you work for, it doesn't matter that those other times you might be working remotely or connected in with technology because now you have the basis of that conversation that can help shape things. So I'm not saying you have to put it aside all the time, but somehow you've got to mix it in with that connecting. Right? When I had a boss who only spoke with me through technology, why would I be connected and engaged and passionate about what I was doing when I never had that face-to-face -face interaction? So you've got to just find that balance. And it's just a small balance, but it can make all the difference in the world. So the question is, you know, I had this moment when I was yelling at myself in the mirror, um, and then I wrote a book. And so what happened in between? And it was a couple year process. So really for me, I knew something wasn't right for a long time. But you know, you get so focused on the work and we were so busy and there was so much going on that I think I just tampered it down, right? And so that day was finally the paper cuts had now bled so much. Um, that I just said, oh my God, like something's not right here. Um, and the, one of the first things I did was um, to really confide in a couple people close to me to say I feel this way and I think I have to do something different. One of the first things I did, no joke, as I thought about my plan was I went and met with my banker to look at my finances to really truly understand where I was in my life and with retirement and financially, could I think about doing something different? So I became very planful, very thoughtful and very planful. And I took a piece of paper out, plain white sheet of paper, forget technology, you could do it on your iPhone, but literally I just went back to the basics and I drew a line down the page. And I, I said, kind of make it or break it, like, what do I need to have and what can I not live with anymore? And I knew I couldn't live with a bully boss anymore. I knew I couldn't live with feeling invisible. But I knew I wasn't ready to just walk away and do nothing. But I also knew that I could walk away and get another HR job. I had a great background. I had a great reputation. I could have gotten another job. But when I looked at that piece of paper, no boss. No more, right? I knew my make it or break it. So I just started thinking about it and started being planful and I knew it wasn't gonna happen overnight. But I just started working on kind of getting right in my head and talking to people and having conversations. And ultimately some things happened um, with reorganizations and others where it was the right time to kind of walk away. So then fast forward, okay, I'm now at home. I've made the decision I'm not going back to a company environment. I have elderly parent issues that I was dealing with back east. I was volunteering for great nonprofit organizations. I was doing all of that. But I couldn't get away from the fact that there was a story to tell inside of me. And so I just kept kind of saying, OK, OK, what's next? And eventually, um, so I'd say from the time I left, um, it was about two years before I sat down to write the book. So it doesn't just happen overnight, but I will tell you that every day of those two years and the time that's happened since, I get up out of bed every day loving my life right now and being passionate about what I do. And I think that was the real difference for me. So I just had to be planful and thoughtful and kind of make it happen. Sure, so the question is that in the research um, that he's done on this topic, uh, a lot of times you see things like employee satisfaction. I thought you were also gonna bring up happy because that also sort of comes up in this, right? Oh, that's about being happy. You know, truth be told, they're all kind of different things, right? Um, so employee engagement is really about that connected loyalty to what you do.
and believing in that and the mission and the purpose and the meaning that you find in a company like this, that doesn't always mean that you're happy every day, right? And truth be told, some people who are really engaged in what they do may not be happy because they see things that are broken that they want to fix. And companies used to measure employee satisfaction before they morphed into engagement surveys. And employee satisfaction is sort of this big overarching thing that you're never quite sure what does that mean, right? So I think over time, um, you know, you can be engaged in what you do but not be satisfied because you want to change the status quo and you want to be an innovator and you want to be a disruptor who said, I'm going to change the world. So I may not be satisfied yet because I want to get us to here. So that's why I see them as different. While they're all important, I just see them as different. And engagement for me is really about the holy grail of saying, I'm just really committed to what we're trying to do here. And I think that's what you want to reach for, if that makes sense, right? So not always about happy. Great question, thank you so much. Yes, so the question is about bullying. So, you know, in today's society, right, the stories that make the news are the kids that are being bullied on the playground, right? Or the, the guy at Rutgers University, Tyler Clemente, years ago, who killed himself when his roommate spied on him. Or maybe you remember the story about Karen, the school bus driver, who got bullied by the kids. And people around the world were so incensed, they ended up contributing over $800,000 to a woman they didn't even know. Those are the stories that are all over the media. Or the kids in Florida, 12 and 14 years old, that killed cause someone to commit suicide. Truth be told, the largest percentage of bullying in the world today is in the workplace, right? And I have a favorite slide, which I, uh, obviously I'm not using slides here, but I pull it up and it says bully, B-U-L-L-Y, and it stands for big, ugly, lonely losers yearning for attention. Because there are a lot of bullies in the workplace and they take shape of things like the intimidator, who thinks that by being the loudest voice in the room, if they yell the loudest, it'll make them the most important, right? Or the snake in the grass who may just put you down at the same time they're taking credit for what you do. Or the sexist bully, you know, who may say to someone, usually a man to a woman, something that's so derogatory to put them in their place. That kind of stuff is out there in a really big way. I stopped counting at four but I've had at least four bully bosses in my career. And it's demoralizing because it zaps you of your self-confidence and you just kind of go, wait a minute, what is this? And you tend to think you're a victim and that's the worst possible thing you could do because truth be told, you may be a target, but trust me, you are not a victim. It's their problem, not yours, right? But that's happening. And organizations today are really inept when it comes to shutting down bullies. They don't know how to do it. They don't know how to do it. And I, I'll say this in a really embarrassing way because I know I have people in HR here that are in the room and I was one of them for a long time. Right? Some of my worst bullies were people that managed HR functions. And I'd say, but they're the ones who are supposed to be changing the world. So that's what's happening in companies today that's so pervasive. So it is absolutely one of the biggest causes of why people get disengaged and shut down. The question really is about, you know, yes, managers are supposed to lead and do things right, but some of them just don't know how to do that and aren't comfortable in that, and there's a lot of conflict around. And so I'm going to answer that in a way because there's some things that I didn't get a chance to talk about that I want to bring out in this. And the first one is, every one of us is a CEO. And I don't mean a chief executive officer because, frankly, who the heck wants all that pressure? But a CEO stands for Chief Engagement Officer. And we can all wear those titles proudly because truth be told, you can't just wait around for somebody to create an engaged environment for you, right? Or a satisfied environment with the previous question. Every one of you has to own it. As employees, you need to own that and own your own engagement. And part of this is really is having a voice and speaking up, but doing it in such a way that it's not confrontational 
And there are many ways of doing that. And I sort of call it an I message, where it's, it's a more quiet kind of reflective of, you know, I'd like to just let you know how I'm feeling about something. And really trying to have that conversation and take the lead. Because here's the really sad part. When you think about kind of engagement and disengagement out there, a large percentage of people who are disengaged today are managers. They're managers. And so if you think about it, a dead battery can't charge another. Right? If you're not engaged, how are you going to engage your team? And it's about trying to get that and have that happen. And I've literally seen teams that have said, you know what, we're going to kind of be a self-managed team and engage ourselves and do those things because we own it. We're CEOs. And so it's just trying all those different things. And at the end of the day, what's so awesome about a company like this is that if it's not working where you are, you have unbelievable opportunities here to do something else and find that manager who is going to be that engaging kind of leader that you need. Join me in thanking Ruth um, for all of her insights and for Thank coming you. and joining us today. Thank you so much.